<clears throat> so uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Longyear with Reed Longyear, Mulnady, Corwin, and Burnett, and welcome to our webinar on estate planning. I'm pleased to be introducing our uh, speakers today, um, uh, Carla Caligaro, uh, Josh Reinertsen, Anton Cawthorn, and Marianne Vance. And they'll be speaking for approximately 12 minutes each, and then we'll leave some time at the end for a uh, question and answer. Uh, appreciate your patience on that. Uh, you can send questions to the uh, Q&A through the chat. Um, and of course, uh, follow up uh, with us uh, you know, individually or collectively uh, by email or phone. And again, welcome. And we'll start our program first with uh, Professional Fiduciaries uh, by Carla Caligaro. And uh, Carla has been with the firm since uh, 2014. Uh, she brings, in addition to her uh, law degree, uh, a background in bioethics and uh, uh, brings a very valuable perspective to our planning process. So, Carla? Good morning. Wonderful. I'm going to speak with you uh, just a few minutes about professional fiduciaries, um, the who, the what, the why, and the when possibly to name them under your estate planning documents. So first, before we dive in, I wanna begin with the question of why you may uh, appoint a professional fiduciary under your estate planning documents. Uh, it may be because of the proficiency, expertise and efficiency of an experienced professional uh, appointing a professional trustee may avoid any actual potential or appearance of conflicts of interest, for example, uh, between your children or having a sibling uh, serve as a trustee of another sibling's trust. Uh, you may appoint a professional fiduciary because there is no other suitable or willing designee uh, for the particular uh, job that uh, you're naming under your document. Uh, and finally, uh, relieving loved ones of the burden of serving uh, as a fiduciary under your documents. Uh, it's a job. <laughs> so we'll return to these ideas in, uh, a little bit later. Let's review the kinds of fiduciaries uh, that you name under your estate planning documents. Um, so we're talking about uh, an agent under a general or financial power of attorney. Uh, you name a healthcare agent under your healthcare power of attorney. Under your will, you will name a personal representative to administer your estate. Uh, in powers of attorney and uh, under your will, if you have minor children, uh, you will uh, nominate uh, guardians and conservators uh, to serve as uh, the guardian or conservator for any minor children. Uh, and lastly, uh, you name an agent under your disposition of remains document to carry out your instructions uh, following your death and the disposition of your bodily remains. And then there's trustee, uh, a full slide for trustee. So you may name a trustee uh, or trustees under your will. Uh, this would be uh, a testamentary uh, trust. And the common types of trusts that uh, you may have under your will include a trust for your spouse, if you predeceased him or her, uh, trusts for grandchildren uh, or children, uh, you may uh, include a special needs trust uh, for a disabled beneficiary who will receive benefits from your estate. And then there are trusts that you may establish during your lifetime. And of course, that may include a trust for spouse, a trust for children, a special needs trust, um, could be a trust to hold real property, uh, could be a life insurance trust to receive life insurance proceeds upon your death a trust to hold LLC interests, or really you name it. Uh, you can get pretty creative with trust uh, in terms of uh, the types of uh, functions uh, that the trust can serve. So what is a professional fiduciary? 
A professional fiduciary is a regulated uh, and or insured, usually both, experienced individual, agency, trust company, corporation, or financial institution with trust powers that serves in one or more fiduciary capacities and is compensated for their services. So who or what uh, are professional fiduciaries? So a professional fiduciary uh, may be a Washington chartered trust company, a corporate trustee, a financial institution with trust authority, a certified professional guardian, and this may be an individual or an agency um, of several certified professional guardians. And there are attorneys who regularly serve as appointed fiduciaries. Clients commonly ask, well, who's watching over the professional fiduciary? Depending on the uh, type of professional fiduciary, for example, a Washington Chartered Trust Company uh, or a financial institution with trust authorities, uh, the professional fiduciary may be subject to the oversight or regulations of, for example, the Washington Department of Financial Institutions, the Washington State Supreme Court, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Office of the Com Comptroller of the Currency, and any person that you designate under your document to whom the fiduciary must account. And then of course, professional fiduciaries, just like non-professional fiduciaries, must comply with all statutory duties duties at law and procedures and other requirements that may be applicable to that particular role. For example, trustee, personal representative, agents under a power of attorney or guardians. So there are statutes, there are laws that lay out uh, duties uh, and of course procedures that must be followed uh, in any one of these uh, fiduciary capacities. The big question, how are professional fiduciaries compensated? It depends. It depends on the type of professional fiduciary we're talking about. And there's variation uh, even within, for example, Washington Chartered Trust Companies uh, of how they uh, charge for fees. So uh, I think the most common uh, forms of compensation are hourly rates, according to a fee schedule, annual percentage based, if the professional trustee or other fiduciary is managing investment accounts or acting as a managing agent of assets. Uh, some charged based on a flat annual rate, depending or assessed on the value of the assets managed. And not uncommonly, it may be a combination. For example, percentage-based plus hourly for extraordinary services or flat plus hourly for specific types of services. Again, depending on the type of work performed or the assets managed. But whether percentage-based, flat rate or hourly, expenses are in addition to fees charged. So expenses uh, may be um, an outside uh, tax preparer or travel, um, those types of things. Uh, a lot on the screen, but I just wanted to show you a few actual examples of uh, uh, the compensation structures for uh, some professional fiduciaries. So this is an example um, of hourly rates um, that this professional fiduciary charges uh, for acting as an agent under a power of attorney 
uh, or as a personal representative. And what you'll see uh, is that there's not just one hourly rate, there are varying hourly rates depending on uh, the function of the service performed and the complexity of that work. So clerical at 65, um, all the way to um, CPA services, for example, at 225. Uh, professional fiduciaries uh, often have uh, uh, some accountant services uh, within their um, uh, firm or, or uh, agency structure. This is an example of uh, trustee uh, flat rates. So you can see that the flat rate is um, based on the uh, variance of the value of the assets that are managed. Uh, it's an annual flat fee uh, that is assessed uh, or rather billed monthly. And here's an example too of the flat fee plus hourly rates uh, for certain types of services, for example, management of closely held entities. And then finally, uh, just a simple annual percentage rate. Uh, this is uh, the annual percentage rate for uh, a professional uh, fiduciary, a Washington Chartered Trust Company uh, who uh, acts as trustee. Uh, and that is uh, annual percentage rate on the first 5 million, uh, could be first 2 million, and then uh, a lower uh, rate assessed on top of that for the next um, 5 million. Uh, for example, uh, with this professional fiduciary. So we come back uh, to our first slide um, as our last slide uh, with why would you want to appoint a professional fiduciary? Again, proficiency, expertise, and efficiency of an experienced professional. Um, these professionals uh, do this work for a living and most of them have been doing it for quite a long time. Uh, so there is uh, experience and uh, knowledge uh, about how to do the work that makes the work, uh, though it's compensated, uh, quite efficient um, from a uh, fiduciary standpoint. Again, appointing a professional fiduciary uh, avoids conflicts of interest, whether these are known, um, maybe between, um, you know, uh, estranged members of the family, or even the potential or appearance of conflict of interest, um, so that you're not putting um, a loved one, for example, in a situation uh, that might make them vulnerable to, um, to criticism or just make their job harder, for example, as trustee. Of course, uh, if there's no other suitable or willing designee, um, a professional fiduciary is an excellent option. And again, to relieve loved ones of the burden. It is a job uh, to serve as personal representative or trustee or agent under a financial power of attorney. And um, most of the time, of course, these jobs uh, as fiduciary uh, are necessary during times of uh, extreme difficulty, dealing with the disability of a parent, dealing with the death of a spouse. Um, so appointing a professional fiduciary might help lessen uh, that burden uh, of, the, of the whole picture. And of course, the one reason or one of the main reasons why we do estate planning and advanced care planning is for peace of mind. So I have been talking about appointment of a professional fiduciary, um, but haven't mentioned yet that what we sometimes recommend for clients uh, is that even if they have a spouse or a trusted daughter or a trusted son uh, that they're very comfortable naming as uh, first appointee or alternate appointee, uh, it's often helpful to consider naming a professional fiduciary in that, for example, third place or second alternate position. Uh, in case, um, given the circumstances at the time of disability or at the time of death, uh, it's really just not practicable for your appointed person to serve or they have uh, predeceased you. So even thinking about naming a professional fiduciary, again, 
in that final alternate position under your documents um, may give you peace of mind. I look forward to your questions. We'll take all questions uh, in the panel uh, at the end of um, my colleagues' presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Carla. That was uh, thoughtful and uh, informative and appreciate that. Our next speaker is uh, Anton Cawthorn, who uh, uh, has been with the firm for uh, many years and uh, has a LLM in addition to his law degree. Uh, Anton also teaches estate planning and estate and gift tax at uh, the uh, Seattle University Law School. So he's, he's the go-to person when we're trying to uh, draft complex uh, tax planning, but also practical things on how to uh, administer estates and, and make the, the documents effective. So if I can do this correctly. Mike. And give me one moment here while I share my screen as well. Okay, there we go. So today I'm gonna to be talking about Washington's new Electronic Wills Act. And I'll also just be discussing in general, how do we sign estate planning documents and why it's so important to sign estate planning documents properly. And so we're actually somewhat in an exciting time in the estate planning world, uh, which is we are going to be on the edge of starting to be able to sign documents, not only in a paper format, but also in electronic format. However, as I'll talk about today, because these laws are new and because of some, some difficulties in the laws, we're not quite there yet. And there's some issues with signing our documents electronically. So let's go ahead and get started and just talk about signing of estate planning documents in general. And so the first thing I wanna talk about is why it's so important that we sign our estate planning documents properly. And the first thing we wanna know is that we need to make sure all of our documents are signed in the proper legal manner, because if they are not properly signed, they will not be valid. Now, if a document is not valid, that means we can run into problems in the future. So I've got a few examples up here on the slide. So what happens if you improperly sign? Well, best case scenario, people don't notice that the document was improperly signed and everything works fine. But in that case, you're just getting lucky. So let's imagine you sign a power of attorney, you mess up the signing of the power of attorney. It's not legally valid. So the person who signed it becomes incapacitated. They can no longer manage their financial affairs. Someone else steps in to manage those finances. Well, the person stepping in goes to the first bank, everything works fine. The bank doesn't really check the signature. They go to the second bank, that bank checks the signature and now the document doesn't work. So the problem in this case is we don't have certainty. We don't know for sure that the document will work because it wasn't properly signed, so it is not a valid document. And so the legal result is without a proper signature is an invalid document and it may be rejected at any point and so it will no longer work. Um, again, we might get lucky. It might continue to work because people just don't properly check. They didn't look to make sure it was a valid document, but we don't want to rely on luck. And the reason for this is the majority of our estate planning documents, actually really all of our estate planning documents are designed to be signed today and then to be used in the future. And very often the documents we sign, they're planning for something like debt or incapacity. And at that point, we will not be able to update or change our documents if they're found to be invalid. So an invalid signing today, we may not discover until a long point in the future. So we wanna make sure all of our documents are signed properly. Now, before we get into electronic signing, I wanna talk about the physical signing of documents and what the requirements are. And so I'm just gonna briefly go through the typical estate planning documents to talk about how we usually sign those. So up here on the slide, I've got a list of documents where we typically say we wanna sign these with a signature and a notary. So POA on the slide, that sounds for power of attorney. So our financial and healthcare powers of attorney, we want those to be signed and notarized in order to be valid. Now there is some other ways we can sign these to be valid under the statute, but this is the best practice. Same thing with the community property agreement, we want a signature and a notary on there for it to be valid. Living trusts are a bit of a unique tool. Technically, we can actually create what's called an oral trust, meaning there's no paper and no signing whatsoever, and it's valid. But again, best practice with a living trust, we also want to sign that and notarize it for it to be valid. The next documents we have that require a signature and a witness. So wills, a directive to physicians, which is a document saying, what are your end of life wishes? And burial instructions and organ donations uh, require a signature and a witness. And then finally, I've got a will here in two separate categories because best practices with the will actually require a signature plus witnesses plus a notary, notary to notarize a statement by the witnesses. And that's our best practice for wills. So this is our, our physical signing rules that we typically follow. Next thing I wanna talk about is 
do you need to actually sign your estate planning documents with an attorney? And there's no legal requirement to do this. Anyone can sign their estate planning documents with whoever they wish as their witnesses and their notary. We, however, usually recommend that people sign their estate planning documents with an attorney or at least a paralegal or someone who's familiar with signing estate planning documents. And the reason it's this is just the experience we've had over the years. So you can sign on your own, but there's problems you can run into. And the first is, what if you make a mistake along the way and you're not aware of it? We're back to the invalid documents problem. The other one is, what if you try to go and get a notary on document and you can't find it? Uh, one really common problem that we see is when people go to their bank to try to have their documents notarized, the banks refuse to notarize those documents. And the funny thing about this too is very often people will call their bank and say, can I come in and have my estate plan notarized? And the bank will say, sure. When they actually go into the bank, the bank will say, oh, actually we don't notarize estate planning documents. So it doesn't actually work. And so even though you're not required to sign with an attorney, it's usually best practice to do so to make sure everything's signed properly and we don't see any mistakes in the documents. Again, you want these documents to be valid. Now, the real question I wanted to get into today is can we sign our estate planning documents electronically? We know the physical versions are valid, but the question is, what about an electronic version? And the answer, as you can see from the slide, is unfortunately a maybe. We don't actually have a clear answer on this question yet, which means best practice is going to be still signing physical documents until we have clear law. The one exception on this is going to be electronic wills. We do have clear law on that, but there's still some problems there. And really the big issue is this is a brand new thing. And again, when we're drafting documents with the goal of being valid at some point later in the future, and we may not test to see if they're valid until the future, well, there's a lot of risk there for drafting something now that may not work. So the best practice is still in most cases going to be a physical document. Now, one other thing I wanna make a note of a difference between two different types of electronic documents. The first one is what I'm calling an electronic document, which means it's a document only on a computer. There is no physical or paper copy of that document. And when we sign that document, the signature is on a screen of some sort. We're signing either um, on a computer, we're signing on a phone, or maybe we're uh, attaching some sort of symbol we've created as our signature. There's no wet ink signature on paper on electronic signing. On the other hand, we have remote signings. And a remote signing is where we actually have two separate paper copies of the document. And we have the witnesses and the notaries and the person signing in different locations, but they're watching each other via Zoom. So in this case, again, the witnesses in one room, looking through Zoom, watching the person signing in a different room via Zoom, and that person signing signs their version, witnesses sign their version, and they later reconnect those, we call them counterparts, into a single version. So these are the two different types of electronic signings we may see, electronic documents or wet ink documents signed remotely. Now, the first question we have to answer when we're trying to talk about whether or not we can sign an electronic document is, is, the, is there actually legal authority to sign the electronic document itself, let alone witness or notarize it. Now in Washington, we have an Electronic Signature Act that tells us whether or not we can sign electronic documents. The problem with our act is that it says it only applies to transactions and it defines transactions as a signature between two or more parties for business purposes. So there's a question under this act whether or not estate planning documents are actually between two or more parties for some sort of business purpose. Arguable either way, we don't have any case law interpreting this, so it's unclear for most of our estate planning documents, if an electronic signature would be valid. You know, I think most likely they will be, but again, thinking they will be is not enough. Let's say we sign an electronic power attorney and it turns out it's interpreted later that a transaction does not include an electronic power of attorney. That document will be invalid and will not be effective. So for that reason, we wanna be cautious using electronic signatures unless we have really good authority. All right, the next question with respect to electronic dom documents is can we electronically notarize them? This one's easier. We have a statute that gives us the authority to electronically notarize any document. But remember, this is only helpful if the person signing has the authority to electronically sign in the first place. Um, so again, there's not much help in being able to electronically sign documents or electronically notarize documents if we can't electronically sign. Now, the next thing to know is there's no statute allowing electronic or sorry, remote notarization of documents. So we can't remotely notarize with a wedding signature on a paper document while watching somebody else sign that document in a different location via Zoom. That is not authorized yet. We can only do an electronic not notarization, not a remote notarization. So let's go ahead and get into our documents. And the first one I wanna look at is an electronic will. And this is one where we actually have a new statute that gives us the authority to sign a will electronically. So our previous statute I talked about says, signing, uh, electronic signing must be a transaction. Where our electronic will statute gets even more specific and says, 
for wills, we can electronically sign a will. We can also have the witnesses sign electronically and we can notarize it electronically. So our Electronic Wills Act does give us the authority to use an electronic signature on the electronic document. Again, no paper document exists in this case and we can validly do that. Uh, the problem in this case is it's a brand new law. We haven't tested it yet. And there's storage requirements where you have to store these electronic documents properly. The issue we might face is what if we have some small error in the storage that is not discovered until later in the future? So really the best practice with electronic wills is only use them in cases where we have no other method and not use them in the majority of cases because we're not quite sure how they're gonna work yet. We wanna wait for other people to be the test cases and figure out are these going to be valid documents. The next thing we have, which is going to be more useful is our Electronic Wills Act also authorized remote signing of wills. What this means is with wills in the future and now we can sign where we have the witnesses sitting in one room, they watch the person signing the will in a different room and everybody's signing a paper copy. And then we later combine those copies to make a single will. So we can do this. And this is gonna be a great new technique we have here in Washington. And that will be a valid will. And we don't have the same sort of risk that we do with the electronic wills. Okay, I'm gonna go through these next documents somewhat quickly here because the answers are gonna be the same for them. So with trust, if we're trying to create a written trust document, there's actually two possibilities. So if we have a trust where the truster and the trustee are the same person, it's unclear if they're valid because we don't know if we have a transaction between two parties. But a trust can also have a truster and trustee who are different people. And in this case, it would appear they are valid because again, we now have a transaction. There's two different parties here to the trust. So likely that would be a valid signature. Um, but on the other hand, we have no authority giving us the authority to remotely sign a trust and memorize it. With electronic powers of attorney, it's unclear if these are valid because of our transaction law relating to electronic signatures. Technically, we could notarize an electronic power of attorney, but it's unclear if our electronic signature act allows us to sign an electronic attorney. So the best practice, probably don't use these until we get better clarity on this law to find out if we can electronically sign a power of attorney. And we also know for sure now you can't remotely sign a power of attorney. So no two paper signatures via Zoom can't do that. Healthcare directive and barrier instructions, also just like powers of attorney, unclear if we can sign these remote or electronically, cannot sign these remotely. So just in summary, what we have now is really the only area where we can draft an electronic and a remote document are wills right now. Every other one of our documents, it's unclear if we can draft an electronic document and we know we cannot draft a remote version of those. So what this means is within an estate plan, we have one easy thing we can sign remotely, uh, wills. So we can do a will via Zoom and with counterparts, wedding signatures by the witnesses in one room, wedding signature by the uh, person signing the will in the other room. But with everything else, since we can't sign those documents remotely or electronically, we're still going to have to do a paper signature. So we still have some problems here. We can't do a full uh, signing of all the estate planning documents remotely, but we're getting close. And so I think my time is up there. So I will end here and turn it back over to Mike Longyear. All right. Uh, thank you, Anton. That was super informative and uh, pretty complex. So we appreciate you taking us through that. And uh, very uh, professorial, I thought, too. <laughs> uh, our next speaker is Marianne Vance, who uh, is, uh, brings uh, lots of experience to estate planning. And she will be talking to us about uh, do's and don'ts of beneficiary designations. And uh, Marianne, do you wanna take it away? Good morning, everyone. I have a bit of an emotional moment having everyone together. I've missed seeing uh, clients during the pandemic. I've missed having our annual seminars and getting to see all of you in my office. And I am so grateful that so many of you have signed up today to participate uh, in this seminar. It means a lot to me to have your confidence. Um, today, I get to talk about my favorite topic. But before that, I wanna say just a personal note that most of you have worked with me before I joined the Reed Longyear firm. And the best darn professional decision I ever made was joining this wonderful firm where I feel like I have the support of the People like you've just heard Carla Calogero and Anton Cawthorn and coming up Josh Reinertson, uh, working with all of them, helping me uh, 
help you has uh, just been uh, rewarding and supportive and has been the best time in my practice. Um, I continue to work full time, although remotely during this. So thank you very much. Um, Meng uh, Che, attorney Meng Che, who's also studying to get his LLM, I also get a lot of great help from him. He's gonna be moving my slides uh, for me today. I am um, coming to you remotely from the beautiful Hawaiian islands and feel very fortunate to be over here for a couple of weeks. So thank you, Meng, for your support. Um, the beginning, uh, this is the most important thing that I talk about with clients. I'm meeting with clients on the phone now uh, many times a week. And the first thing that we have to sort out always is that even though you're paying gobs of money to me to write your will, it's only gonna cover part of your estate. So for all of you, and all my clients are, take really good notes, I know that, for everyone listening, and hello to those of you I haven't met before, is if you are taking notes, I recommend you draw two big circles on your piece of paper right now. And one is gonna be called bucket one, which is your will. And the other bucket is everything not controlled by your will. And I'm gonna to refer to bucket one and bucket two as we walk through this. So the first thing to keep in mind is that for most of my clients right now, 50% of their assets are not being controlled by the will. Why is that? Because my clients typically have retirement accounts and because the stock market has increased dramatically over the past few years, they have a lot of money in their retirement accounts. They have a beneficiary named as to who's gonna receive that retirement account when they die. And this is not controlled or corrected by the will document. So I want to talk about bucket one, which is your will and bucket two, which is your non-will assets that are controlled by you designating a beneficiary on a specific piece of paper that I often have never seen. So going to the PowerPoint, your will, will will name the heirs to your estate. Most of you on this call have a will, but in case your sister does not have a will, what you should tell her is that she really does have a will because the state of Washington's written a law that says where your estate goes if you have no will. And the answer to that is typically to your next of kin. Could be your spouse. If you don't have a spouse, it's gonna go to your your kids, it can end up going to your parents, it can end up going to your siblings, especially the brother that you particularly like. So we advise having a will. But again, the will only controls certain assets and that's what we'll talk about in the next few minutes. Point number three says your beneficiary designations in your retirement accounts, that's one pot, that's in bucket two, retirement accounts. Also life insurance, bucket two, Annuities, bucket two. Why? Because you have named beneficiaries to most of those accounts. Whatever you said in your will won't affect where that money goes when you die. Number four, you could have a bank account or real estate held in joint tenants with right of survivorship. And sometimes you'll see the acronym J-T-R-O-S, JUTROT. No matter what your will says, the other person on that account will automatically, at the moment of your death, receive everything in that account or become 100% entitled to that real estate if you held with joint tenants with right of survivorship. Uh, so other items where uh, you're in bucket two is you've signed a community property agreement called a prenuptial agreement or um, a status of property agreement and where you agree with your crowd spouse where your property is going to go at your death. Again, your will, bucket one, isn't touching any property that's identified in your community property agreement that way. And lastly is your employee benefit. The typical assets controlled by your will, you're back to bucket one. Usually what my clients have is real estate, their house. They may have a rental property. Number two, tangible personal property such as furniture, jewelry, and vehicles. Usually that's controlled by the will. And usually the bank and checking accounts where you haven't named a beneficiary, then those will be controlled by the will. 
But remember that beneficiary designation that you've made in your retirement account overrides the will. So when you're looking at bucket one and bucket two, remember bucket two overrides bucket one, okay? We also wanna keep in mind a note on there that even though I'm talking about bucket one and bucket two, um, the good news or the bad news, good news for the government, the bad news for all of us is that federal and Washington state gift tax, uh, inheritance tax is charged on both bucket one and bucket two. All the assets you have, whether they're controlled by your will or controlled by beneficiary designations are subject to Washington and the federal state tax. Next slide, please. What are the assets? We've talked about what's in your will, but what are you controlled by beneficiary designations? And a lot of my clients, and when you're working with me, I make you fill out that darn questionnaire and I make you itemize every single account you have. And by the time we've gotten to a certain age, many of us are surprised by the small amount, but by smaller accounts that we maybe haven't thought of coming from say prior employers. So on the left column on the retirement accounts, you can see the uh, typical retirement accounts, which is traditional IRAs through profit sharing plans. There's a long list there, so think if you have them. I wanna go to the next slide. My time is running a short and give you what to do now. So for those of you that are taking notes, I would like all of you today to contact the financial company and request a copy of your current beneficiary designation page. When you order this, get all of the pages. I invite my clients to send me those beneficiary designation pages and I will weigh in as to how I think if they've been completed correctly. If you're looking at it on a screen, push the print button. So if you're taking one to-do item away from this conversation today, is contact the financial companies, get a copy of those beneficiary designations. Don't presume that you name the beneficiaries you want. You'll have two categories on that form. First is the primary beneficiary, uh, and the second one is often called the secondary or contingent beneficiary. Most important thing is to look at who you've named as the primary beneficiary to check the percentages that you have given for to each person. And the most difficult of all is what happens, let's say you've named your two kids and unfortunately one of your children dies before you, then what happens to your deceased child's share? Does it go to the grandkids or does it go to the survivor? There is default language written into every one of these forms. And my guess is that most of us are not aware of what the default language is. So if you want it to go to the grandkids, you gotta get the Persterpes box checked, which is Latin just to make it difficult for you, or you need to contact your brokerage and give them specific instructions as to what should happen if one of your children predeceases you. Same speech for the secondary beneficiaries. When you've got at the bottom, if all of the primary beneficiaries are deceased, it will go to the contingent or secondary beneficiary. So think about that. Next slide, and I'll close. Uh, additional thoughts. Um, when you're naming beneficiaries, a lot of clients have put in the phrase, my estate in their retirement accounts. This is not the best thing to do. The money will ultimately pour into your will, but it will pour into your will, allowing the government to take the maximum possible income tax. We recommend that you name the beneficiaries and giving them um, specific names, and then they can I'll roll it over. And for minor children, we often have the beneficiary as the trustee of the trust for the beneficiary of my children as stated in my last will. We can follow up on this point in the Q&A. Remember on the new retirement rules, anyone you're leaving money to pretty much has to take it all out within 10 years. I've gone over my time as usual, but thank you all very much. And that's it. Talk to you in Q&A. Marion, thank you so much. Uh, always informative and a lot to think about and, and definitely things to follow up uh, consulting with uh, attorneys and, and uh, CPAs as to uh, those beneficiary designations and, and what's 
the most uh, tax efficient, but also meets your planning goals. So our next speaker is uh, Josh Reinertsen, who's been with the firm first as an intern and then as an associate uh, graduate of Seattle U uh, Law School and the University of Washington LLM program. And Josh is going to be talking to us about the uh, living trust as estate planning uh, considerations related to that. So Josh, take it away. Uh, good morning, everyone. So Marianne's in Hawaii and I'm in Montana. So I'm hoping my internet connection will be a, a little bit more stable, but we'll, we'll see. So we, uh, we frequently have clients who come to us and say that they want to set up a revocable living trust uh, in order to avoid probate. And that can be a really good reason to set up a trust, uh, depending on their particular cir circumstances. But as we'll see here, uh, there can be other reasons as well. Um, because avoiding probate is a key advantage of the living trusts, I'm going to go ahead and take us right off on a tangent and give you a really brief summary of estate planning with a will and the probate process in order to provide some contrast uh, to estate planning with a revocable living trust. And so I'm not going to say much about wills. Uh, we all know what they are. It's a document that governs the disposition of your assets and the settlement of your estate uh, after you pass away. Um, as Mary Ann mentioned, the will does not control assets with beneficiary designations. Uh, and that's also true with revocable living trusts as well. So that's something to keep in mind and make sure you keep your beneficiary designations up to date and consistent with your overall estate plan. Um, I think for the purposes of my presentation, you just need to keep in mind that the will designates a personal representative. And that's the person who's responsible for managing and distributing your estate according to the terms of the will. And most importantly, the will goes through the probate process. Now, what is probate? Uh, probate is a court supervised process for settling your estate. Uh, in other words, paying debts, uh, taxes, uh, and then ultimately making distributions to your, to your beneficiaries. Um, but it also, so what is probate? It's the court supervised process for settling your estate, paying taxes, uh, settling uh, debts, and then making distributions to your beneficiaries. Um, but it also makes sure that people that are interested in your estate, uh, that could be beneficiaries, creditors, or even sometimes people that are excluded uh, from your will, uh, the process makes sure that they receive notice of your passing and have a mechanism for protecting uh, any interest that they might have in your estate. Uh, probate has a bad reputation, but I think as we'll see, it's uh, fairly straightforward and it's a pretty easy process in, in Washington. Um, some kind of highlights about the probate process, uh, the personal representative that's named in your will has to be confirmed by the court uh, before they have authority to administer your estate. They can't take your will and just start moving around assets. After you pass away, they have to file a petition with the court and ask to be confirmed as the personal rep representative before they can administer your estate. Um, generally, that's not a problem if they're named in your will, the court will appoint the representative right away, uh, but there can be some delay uh, in that process and getting a court hearing and things like that, especially uh, with, with COVID. Um, once the personal representative is appointed, they have to mail out uh, notice that the probate is open uh, to both beneficiaries uh, named in the will and anyone who is entitled to a portion of your estate if you died without a will. Um, so that can end up providing notice uh, to people that you didn't intend to and that you, you don't want them to know anything about your, your estate planning. Um, once the will is accepted by the court, there's a four month period during which someone can challenge the validity of the will. And that's you know typically gonna be somebody that's not named in the will. Um, and because of that notice, they would have the chance to challenge the will. Um, the personal representative also has to compile an inventory of assets and debts of your estate within three months. Uh, beneficiaries and creditors of your estate, they can request that inventory. So they'll get a full picture of what's, what's in your estate. Um, the last thing I'll say about probate in Washington is that it's, it's a fairly streamlined and efficient process compared to other states. Uh, the personal representative can request uh, that uh, the court grant them non-intervention powers. Uh, this essentially means that the personal representative does not uh, need to uh, seek court permission for each step of the probate process, uh, like paying creditors or making distribution. And that really keeps the probate process uh, streamlined and, and efficient. Um, also in Washington, attorneys set their own uh, fees and generally charge an hourly rate. Other jurisdictions, uh, particularly uh, California 
uh, attorney fees are set by statute and it's based on a percentage of the value of the estate. So even if you have a relatively simple estate, uh, it can end up costing a lot of money if you know you have an asset, one asset in your estate, like a, a residence that's worth a lot of money. And so that's one, one reason you see uh, revocable living trusts used in, in other states uh, and, and less so in Washington. So let's get back to talking about trusts. What is a trust? Well, it's essentially a substitute for your will. It contains you know, many of the same distributive provisions. Unlike the will, it establishes a, a separate legal entity with, that's distinct from you and your estate. Um, and because it's its own entity, it doesn't need to go through the probate process. Once you set up the trust, you have to transfer your financial accounts and property into the trust so that it becomes the owner of those assets. Uh, the trustee, who will typically be you, but it could be uh, another person or you could have a co-trustee to act with you. The trustee then manages those assets during your lifetime for your benefit. Uh, an important note here is the trust only controls those assets that are owned by the trust. Um, and that's important because, well, what if you leave assets outside of the trust or you acquire assets that you never put in the trust during your lifetime, what, what happens? Well, those assets, Will likely have to go through the probate process um, because there will be nobody to transfer them into the trust at your death. Um, I'll also note here that even if you have a revocable living trust, you should still have a will as a backup in case the assets, uh, there are assets outside of the trust. Uh, we call these pour over wills and they're basically simple wills that distribute any assets you forget that are left outside of your trust into the trust at your death. Um, and that allows those assets to be distributed to your beneficiaries under the, under the terms of the trust. And just a couple points here. These are pretty common misconceptions about what revocable living trusts do. Um, first, they don't provide any protection from your creditors. So if you're involved in an accident, uh, trust assets are not protected merely because they're in the trust. There might be other reasons those assets are protected, uh, but it's not because they're, they're inside the trust. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind. It's very difficult in Washington to uh, protect assets from creditors. And then second, uh, having a revocable living trust does not shield your, uh, the, the assets in your trust from Washington estate taxes. Um, there's both a Washington estate tax and a federal estate tax. The Washington estate tax kicks in once you have $2.2 million uh, worth of assets, including anything in your trust. Uh, so you might want to worry about doing extra planning to reduce your estate tax liability and, and leave more money for your beneficiaries if you're over that threshold. Um, especially for married couples, there are some pretty great techniques for minimizing estate taxes that can be incorporated into your trust, but the trust itself does not, not avoid the estate tax. So now we're getting to the really the, the core of the presentation here is when should you consider using a living trust? Uh, one of the biggest reasons we use a trust uh, is if you're a Washington resident and you own real estate outside of Washington. Um, we've talked about probate not being a really big deal in Washington because it's a, a streamlined process. But, you know, if you own a vacation uh, condo in Florida or Hawaii or something like that, um, what happens when you die is you end up needing a separate probate in that state in order to transfer the property. Uh, real property has to be probated, probated in the state in which it's situated. So what ends up happening is you end up paying two attorneys to help you with two different probates. Placing the property in a revocable living trust uh, avoids the need for that second probate. And if you put all your Washington assets in the revocable living trust as well, you'll avo avoid both probates. Uh, a second reason to have a living trust is privacy. Uh, when a will is probated, it goes uh, into the court record and anyone can see it. Um, this has been an issue that's come up more and more. Uh, we've had real estate agents contacting uh, personal representatives of an estate uh, and uh, in order to get their, the house uh, that's owned by the estate listed. Uh, and so the, the point really there is that there are people that, that look through the court record. Um, and so if you're concerned about uh, you know, anyone being able to access that and seeing what's in your will, 
then a trust might be might be a better benefit for you. <clears throat> the other privacy advantage is that the trustee doesn't typically need to provide notice to anyone other than the beneficiaries uh, named in the trust document. Uh, so with going back to probate, you would need to give uh, notice to anyone that would receive uh, a portion of your estate under the will if there, if there was no will. And that's not the case with the trust. Uh, so you can avoid some issues there of notifying people that, uh, that you don't want to. Um, a third reason for having a living trust is to plan for your own incapacity or simply plan for a time when you need or want extra help managing your assets. Um, as you age or if you have particular healthcare conditions, uh, you can have a trusted uh, family member or friend uh, that can be designated as a co-trustee on the trust and can step in to manage your assets for your benefit. And also, if you become incompetent uh, and are unable to manage your finances, you know, in Washington, unless you have a power of attorney document, you're typically going to have to go into uh, a guardianship and a guardian is going to be appointed uh, to manage your assets. And that's a public process. It's a very cumbersome process. Uh, and the trust can help avoid that um, and keep that private and out of the public record. And then I think the, the final point here uh, <clears throat> in terms of advantages is segregation of ownership. Um, and maintaining the character of assets. Washington is a community property state, which means that absent a written agreement between spouses, most assets acquired during the marriage are owned 50-50 between the spouses, uh, regardless of how that asset is titled. Uh, sometimes one spouse will have separate property, however, uh, that the other spouse doesn't have an ownership interest in. Uh, so for example, one spouse might inherit uh, uh, assets from their parents, and under Washington law, that's the separate property of the spouse that receives it. The issue becomes that if you receive that inheritance and your community property with your spouse is intermingled with that inheritance, that inheritance can become community property. And it, it then creates an ownership interest of the other spouse in that property. And that's fine for some, for some spouses, maybe that you don't care, um, but if you want to preserve that asset uh, and pass it down just to your side of the family, putting that inheritance into a, a revocable living trust only for your benefit is an effective way to ensure that that inheritance doesn't become commingled and no one else uh, develops an ownership interest. Uh, some of the disadvantages of a revo revocable living trust, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot to say up here, but. Um, uh, it really, it comes down to the cost of setting it up. Uh, trusts are somewhat more expensive than doing a will. The terms are a bit more complicated. Um, and then the assets need to be transferred into the trust in order for the, for the trust to work. Um, <clears throat> um, so for example, uh, your property, you're gonna need to prepare a deed, sign a deed and record it with the, with the county in order to transfer into the trust. And if you own business interest, interests, uh, for example, membership in an LLC, you're gonna have to prepare extra documentation in order to transfer that business interest into the trust. Uh, the biggest issue with the trust, and we see this pretty frequently, uh, is that you end up wasting your money because you didn't keep all of your assets titled in the name of the trust. If you don't review your assets and accounts frequently and forget to place them in the trust, then you end up having to go through probate anyway. Um, and so you've, you've spent all this money setting up the trust and the plan and it, and, and it essentially failed. Um, so there is a procedure in Washington to avoid probate if the assets left outside of the trust are less than $100,000. But again, you end up having to go through that process and there's extra expenses. So you wanna avoid that. And I'm going over time here. So I'm gonna kind of skip through this. Uh, in terms of taxes for income taxes while you're alive, any income to the revocable living trust, any assets that are in the trust that, that accrue income, that's all reported on your individual income tax return and reported at your own, own rate. And again, the, the trust is also subject to Washington and federal estate taxes. And so I'll leave that here. Uh, just, you know, I think with the trust, it really comes down to reviewing your assets and your planning goals with, with an attorney and, or your advisor and seeing if that really makes sense for you. If you have a trust in place, really good idea to review every couple of years 
uh, make sure that the trustees designated in the trust are still appropriately appropriate people to serve in that position. Uh, and of course, make sure all your assets are titled into the name of the of the trust so that it has the intended effect of avoiding probate. So I uh, kind of blew through that here. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. My email address is right there at the bottom. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mike. Okay, uh, thanks so much, Josh. Yeah. And uh, uh, a lot of great information and a lot to uh, think about and certainly talk about with our clients as we uh, work on their planning. Uh, there have been you know, several questions uh, in both the Q&A and in the chat. Um, I think one, one area that we uh, didn't get to uh, in much detail in the presentations was on minor children and how planning can be uh, done to uh, provide for uh, minor children. And uh, I know uh, we've all had experience with that. Uh, I might just comment that the, you can name a guardian. There's been a change in uh, Washington law regarding guardianships so that the name of the, or the title rather, of the guardian of the estate is now conservator. Uh, and so uh, folks with minor children would wanna name both the guardian as custodian and a uh, conservator for management of the assets. That would be separate from any testamentary trust for the benefit of the children under the terms of the will. Uh, uh, guardianship conservatorship ends at age 18. The trust, of course, can continue until a later date when the child uh, has established themselves, perhaps completed post-secondary education or uh, reached a certain age. Uh, you can also name a guardian and conservator for your minor child in a, a financial power of attorney. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Josh or Carla, Anton, Marianne, any additional comments you wanna make about minor uh, children in estate planning? Uh just want to say that I don't think we have um, video access right now. So uh, that's why we're seeing our, our names and not our faces. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I would like to say something about minor children. Um, you know, those sweet, adorable five-year-olds um, that we're writing a trust and we're sure our kids are going to be like sane and sensible when they're 18 or 21 or 25. Uh, as the kids develop and mature, uh, my clients often come back to me and change the age of the trust set up in their will for their minor children. Um, and some of the times the trusts have been set up to the age of 30, which is very common. But when you have a really, well, you know, good functioning 27 year old kid, you know, getting along in life, you could uh, change your will and eliminate the trust. So uh, minor children are defined as children under the age of 18, but the trust usually go longer than the age of 18 when we're uh, trying to protect our kids. Thanks. And just to uh, add to that, if a child has disabilities or uh, particular issues where the protection of a trust uh, is important, you know, that's, that's a question, uh, issue, a topic to really uh, talk about with the attorney. Uh, we do a fair amount of planning for families where a, a child does have special needs or has disabilities or may have uh, chemical dependency issues that, uh, or mental health issues that we want to provide protections uh, and some uh, guidance for there. Uh, kind of going on to the next uh, point was on the beneficiary designations. And uh, Marianne did such a good job at, at going through the importance of that uh, and the benefits and uh, going back to Josh's comments too about a living trust and uh, how that works with uh, the overall estate plan. I get, uh, Josh and Marianne, do you wanna comment on beneficiary designations for trusts and estates? I'll let Josh go with that. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a whole lot to add there. I, I do agree with Marianne's point in her presentation, you know, naming an estate is not not always the best option. Uh, and one one example of this is uh, life insurance proceeds. Uh, it's generally exempt from creditors, but once you name the estate, uh, it becomes liable for the the estate's creditors. So you want to be careful about how you're designating your your accounts. And uh, 
I'm also going to mention the retirement accounts. And on our uh, uh, website, uh, Josh did a, a great article, blog post on the Secure Act and how uh, working with retirement accounts, Marianne mentioned the 10-year the term that's under the SECURE Act uh, as distinguished from the spousal uh, rollover accounts. Again, those are particular uh, issues and account designations to, to really uh, go through with the attorney in the estate planning process. Uh, several questions about this program and, and it has been recorded so, uh, those that would like to see it again or share it, uh, we will be providing a link. Uh, best to check the, the website for that link because uh, that's where we'll find it. And then the question about uh, whether or not a, uh, the threshold for setting up a trust. Uh, Josh, do you want to maybe comment on that since you spoke about trust? Sorry, Mike, can you repeat the question there? Which is what's the, the threshold value for setting up a trust? let's say a revocable living trust, when, when would that make sense? I, I think it can make sense at, at any point. Um, you know, I, I think it's really more driven about, uh, you know, what, what assets you have. So in my example, uh, you know, having property out of state, I mean, a, a probate in another state is gonna cost, you know, I, I would think, you know, at least three, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000, you know, at least. Uh, you know, and, and trusts are kind of in the similar price range. So it, it makes sense to set that up in order to avoid having that, those complications. Uh, Anton, do you want to touch on the, the differences between testamentary trust and living trust? Yeah, I can do that. It looks like my, my video is still blocked, but I'll answer it. So. Yeah, the difference between a testamentary trust versus a living trust is the date on which it's created. So testamentary is a word just like last will and testament. It means that the trust is created at the moment of death. Now for that to happen though, the terms of the trust actually have to be created ahead of time. So we're gonna have some document, oftentimes a will, that will contain all the terms for how the trust operates, naming the trustee and the beneficiaries. So that's created ahead of time. But testamentary means it doesn't exist, so it doesn't come into effect until the person passes away. A living trust, on the other hand, is created immediately. So somebody creates a trust, the moment they sign, that's a valid existing trust, even while they're alive. That's why we call it a living trust. And on the other end, we've got a testamentary trust, which is one that's created when someone passes away. Again, terms of that trust are created now, but the trust doesn't come into existence until they die. Uh some questions on uh, community property, quote unquote, and uh, with domestic partners, uh, the, the sort of uh, technical term that we use is committed intimate relationships, CIRs. And uh, I know we've, we've uh, certainly all worked with these. Uh, uh, Anton, do you wanna talk about CIRs a little bit and how, how property is handled in CIRs? Yeah, so CIRs or committed intimate relationships are Washington's answer to kind of the idea of if people have been living together for long enough, if we should treat them as if they're married. And what it does is if people live together in a marriage-like relationship, and it's, it's not really a clear line when that happens, but at some point when they're living in a marriage-like relationship, they will actually start generating community property just like a married couple. Now they don't have any other rights that a married couple has. The only thing they generate is community property just like a married couple has. And again, it's unclear when that starts. And the two times it's become relevant are either one in divorce, which we're not really talking about here, or two, when someone passes away, if there's community property, and in this case, if the people were in a committed intimate relationship, which created community property, now when one of them dies, whoever dies controls one half of the community property alone. Whereas if it was all separate, they would each control all of their own earnings. But again, if they have community property, that means their earnings are now community. And so each of them controls one half of that when one of them passes away. It's, it's kind of a complex system and it actually can result in a lot of disputes about when the marriage-like relationship began. So when the community property started. All right. So Josh, a uh, question on uh, small businesses, uh, ownership in revocable living trusts. I know uh, we've worked on some projects like that. Do you wanna address how that's handled? Yeah, so with if you own, if you set up a revocable living trust as kind of the primary driver of your, your estate plan, uh, you want to make sure that whatever your ownership interest is uh, in an LLC or other business, uh, that that 
makes it into the trust because you know typically that's going to go through the probate process if it's not inside inside of the trust you know and another point i'll bring up too with with out of state property this is a little bit off topic but um if you own rental property in another state you can actually use an llc uh for that property uh in order to avoid probate as well um, because that property is owned by the the llc and the LLC interest can be distributed in the Washington probate to the beneficiaries. Um, and so there's no need for a probate in that, that jurisdiction. And that having that in an LLC also gives you the, the creditor protection uh, from, from renters or, you know, if you're using Airbnb or something like that. So that can be another option as well. Uh, Carla, a question about fiduciary duties. Uh, do you want to discuss fiduciary duties for a trustee of a living trust? Uh, how, how is that different than just being the owner of the property? What's the, the, the duty of that trustee? Uh, any trustee uh, in Washington state uh, is subject to uh, many statutory uh, provisions uh, about how a trustee must um, manage assets uh, and uh, reporting duties uh, and fiduciary duties. So uh, prudent investor rule, for example, uh, or duty of loyalty, um, that the trustee must avoid conflicts of interest. Um, and this is true, uh, as I mentioned, uh, whether we have a professional fiduciary trustee or a non-professional trustee, uh, I will say that uh, the, the professional fiduciaries, um, uh, as you would expect, are, are much more uh, cognizant uh, of, their, um, of their fiduciary duties as laid out uh, under the law. Um, than non-professional fiduciaries. Um, so if, if you do have a non-professional um, fiduciary serving as a trustee, for example, uh, it's always a very good idea for them to, uh, to have an attorney um, to counsel them about what their fiduciary duties are and make sure that they are adhering to uh, any statutory reporting requirements uh, or any of the specific terms of the trust, um, which um, may alter um, the uh, statutory uh, default uh, duties and procedures. Thank you. So Anton, a question on life insurance proceeds, uh, what's taxable, what's not? And I think uh, maybe making that distinction between income and estate tax might be helpful. Yeah, so with life insurance, this is one of those things that confuses people because we have two different taxes we talk about, as Michael mentioned. So there is an, an income tax and there's also an estate tax, which are two separate taxes. And so life insurance is excluded from income tax, meaning if you receive a life insurance payout, it's great for you because you don't pay any income taxes, it's just tax-free money. So if you get a million in life insurance, it's not reduced by income taxes in any way. However, when someone passes away, if they are the owner of the policy so they're, and they're the insured, um, it will be included in their estate if they have the ability to control it or if it's payable to their estate. And effectively what this means is even though you don't pay income taxes on receiving life insurance, your estate will still have to add in the value of the life insurance when you're calculating how much estate taxes are due. And I guess, that, um, if, Marianne, go ahead. No, go ahead, Mike. I, I was just gonna say, sometimes if life insurance isn't claimed immediately, there can be some accrued income on the uh, proceeds and that, that amount of any accrued income after date of death would be includable in an income tax uh, return. But that, to Anton's point, it's on, on the uh, on the payout. It, it's not uh, taxable for income tax purposes. So, uh, Mike, I wanted to add a comment um, on Carla's excellent presentation of the use of professional fiduciaries, if I may. Sure. Um, in in talking with clients, people often want to name a trusted family member in the role of a fiduciary. And they will usually say, I say, why do you think this person would be a good choice? And they will say, well, I trust them. I know they'll do the right thing. And that's lovely to know that they would be loyal, but they may not be experienced in the task. So the question that I've started asking my clients is, but do they have any experience in closing up a $3 million business? in the next six months? And the answer is generally no to that. And the what I'm trying to stress is that when somebody, when you die, and if your assets are half a million dollars, $2 million or more, 
It's a lot of money. It's a lot of assets. It's a complex job. And it is really a burden on family members. And I have been really encouraging clients to be open to the possibility of the professional fiduciaries and feel strongly. And that is something that has developed uh, for me over the years. Thank you. All right, Marion, thank you for uh, those comments and, and that, that perspective, because I, I think the, uh, the complexity that can happen with, with an estate uh, can be confusing and uh, it's really helpful to have the experience of a professional uh, guiding uh, the estate process. So we're, we're over our time. Uh, we want to thank each and every one of you so much for being uh, part of our program today, uh, attending, and then, of course, our, our speakers and presenters. And uh, do encourage you to reach out to us uh, individually or through our blog or our website. Uh, our emails are on the website. Uh, that's uh, readlongyearlaw.com. Uh, I do encourage you to read some of the excellent articles that have been posted, uh, particularly some of the uh, information that Carla has uh, prepared uh, regarding dementia care, uh, long-term care, and uh, that Josh has written about uh, tax issues, and Anton has written about tax and the electronic wills. So. Uh, we invite you to do that and invite you to please reach out to us and uh, look forward to uh, working with you, hearing from you and helping you through this process. Thanks so much. Have a great day and a wonderful uh, 2022.